Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to the members of our community and our panelists. My name is Chris Davey. I'm a graduate of The Ohio State University and a, a, a public relations practitioner and a former journalist and a member of the alumni board here at Ohio State and the School of Communication. I want to thank you all for joining us today. We find ourselves at the crossroads of a rapidly evolving media landscape where the boundaries of journalism, public relations, and communications are continually reshaped by technological advancements, immense challenges in the business of news, and the funding of journalism, the increasing prevalence of fake news, and declining levels of public trust. Just a few statistics to run through to uh, illustrate what we're talking about. The number of daily newspapers subscribers has declined by more than half since 2000. In 2000, there were 55.8 million daily newspaper subscribers. By 2020, that number had fallen to 24.2 million. The revenue of the newspaper industry has declined by more than two thirds since 2002, uh, about 58%. And correspondingly, the number of journalists working in the United States has declined by nearly a third just since 2008. And along that, with this, we've seen a decline in traditional journalism We've seen a rise in uh, the wild west of social media, misinformation and disinformation. A seminal 2018 study by MIT researchers found that for a variety of reasons, fake news spreads much faster and more widely than the truth. And I think we've all seen the consequences of this in our daily lives just as citizens. Just this week, there was a report that suspected Chinese operatives have used images made by artificial intelligence to mimic American voters online in an attempt to spread disinformation and provoke discussion on divisive political issues as the 2024 U.S. election approaches. The Chinese are a new entrant into this practice. Uh, we saw the same uh, activity by the Russian government and operatives in 2016 uh, and in 2020, and this has been very well documented. It's not fake news. And Along with all of this, and probably a consequence of it, is we're facing a crisis of trust. Since 1979, Gallup has been measuring Americans' trust in 14 institutions, from banks to the military to public schools and the media. The 2022 survey by Gallup found that the average level of trust across institutions was at its lowest in the 43 years of the poll. I don't think that these things are unrelated. This afternoon, what we aim to do is to delve into these issues and chart a way forward. We aim to envision and point toward a future where the stories we tell and the narratives we shape are anchored in truth, credibility, and public interest. And we have three distinguished panelists, all uh, from the School of Communication at Ohio State, uh, to um, uh, join us in this discussion. I'd like to begin by introducing these panelists and then uh, get into our questions. First, we have a Kayla Gardner, a recent graduate of our School of Communication, who serves as the White House correspondent for Bloomberg News. Welcome, Akela. Throughout her career, Akela has journeyed both domestically and internationally to provide in-depth reporting on the Biden administration. Notably, she covered President Biden's trip to London for Queen Elizabeth's funeral, documented Vice President Harris's groundbreaking visit to Africa, and has recently brought insights from the Group of 20 Summit in India. As the 2022 midterm elections approach, Akela was on the ground shadowing Biden on numerous campaign stops. She remains actively engaged in monitoring the president's re-election campaign. Her exceptional reporting has garnered recognition being featured in prestigious platforms such as the Washington Post, Politico, NPR, MSNBC, BBC, and CNN. Again, welcome Akela. We also are honored to have Leonard Downey Jr. join us. Len serves as the Wheel Family Professor of Journalism at the Arizona State University's Walter Cronkite School of Journalism. He was executive editor of the Washington Post from 1991 to 2008, overseeing a team that won 25 Pulitzer Prizes. He was a key figure in uh, the newspaper's Watergate investigation. His extensive career spans investigative reporting, editing, and foreign correspondence. Len holds degrees from The Ohio State University and he is the author of several books, including a memoir and works on investigative journalism. 
a founder of Investigative Reporters and Editors Incorporated. He currently advises KFF Health News. He resides in Washington, D.C. with his wife, Janice. Welcome, Lynn. Thank you. And last, we have Kelly Garrett, a respected professor and the director of the uh, School of Communication at The Ohio State University. Kelly's uh, research delves into understanding how media consumption and digital communication platforms shape individuals' political attitudes, beliefs, and behaviors. This encompasses studies on misinformation, social media, and selective exposure. In pursuing this research, Garrett often, or Kelly often collaborates with experts from a, a wide array of fields, such as political science, psychology, information, and computer science. He has been the recipient of more than $2 million in research support with generous funding from esteemed institutions like the National Science Foundation, Social Science Research Council, and META. His groundbreaking work has been featured in various renowned outlets, including Science Advances, the, Journalism, the Journal of Communication, the Journal of Computer Mediated Commission, Communication, Political Behavior, and JAMA Network Open, to name just a few. Welcome, Kelly. Thanks very much for taking the time to join us today. Thanks, Chris. All right, I want to start with Akela. Um, as you know, a more recent journalism uh, graduate from our school and the only member of our panel who's currently practicing journalism in this environment, I just want to ask if you could uh, share some initial uh, reflections on the topic. Yeah, well, first of all, great to be here. Great to be alongside everybody. Um, I would just say what you laid out, I think there's so many challenges to our industry right now, and not just challenges to journalism, but also you know, threats to our democracy. I know you mentioned AI and the the actors that we're seeing trying to influence, you know, the upcoming election. So there's certainly things at every front that, you know, that we're facing. But I also think that at the same time, there's a lot of opportunities. I think there's a lot of organizations that are investing in social media, investing in video and trying to reach people, trying to reach young people in particular, where they are, because I think a lot of the decline that we're seeing is because young people are not investing in things like subscription or they're not buying cable news you know, outlets anymore. They're not paying for those packages anymore. Um, so I think news organizations are recognizing that they have to reach these audiences in order to remain relevant, but also to keep making money. Um, and I think anyone who works in journalism right now knows how much the business is impacting the work that we do we have to be able to sustain ourselves as an industry. Um, and that presents its own challenges. Thank you. I wanna to turn to Len um, and ask the same thing for some initial reflections on this topic of the um, the state of journalism, the future of journalism, and uh, you know, bringing the perspective of someone who operated in an era where it was much different, when we didn't have the internet, when the, when the industry was thriving economically, and things were just mu much different, and then someone that's teaching it today. So if you could uh, offer some initial reflections from that perspective. Sure, first I wanna say I agree with everything that Kayla said, so I won't repeat that. Uh, I, I've been doing research lately on what's happening with local news around the country. Uh, there are really two different issues here. One is the national news media, which there are plenty of, and, and all kinds of issues involved in the national media these days. Uh, but the other are, is local news, and local news has really suffered. Uh, about one fifth of the country now has no local news whatsoever, no local newspaper, no local television station providing local news. However, at the same time, there's been relatively recently, uh, there's been a strong movement to do something about this. Uh, just on uh, uh, September 7th, which is just a few days ago, uh, there was an announcement by 22 national foundations in the United States that they've banded together for something called Press Forward, and they've committed a half billion dollars over the next five years. Uh, to putting money into resuscitating local news around the country. Uh, that means starting more, uh, there are already uh, a number of online news organizations in cities around the country where they've lost newspapers or the newspapers have been hollowed out by, uh, by the circumstances you discussed, Chris, in your thing. Uh, and uh, uh, they're also investing in public public radio uh, news, local news around the country, and a variety of other ways to, uh, to to deal with this. There are also other foundations, both national and local, who already have been investing in local news around the country too. The audiences are still relatively small. 
Uh, the organizations are still relatively small, uh, ranging from a few, report, few few reporters to, in some cases, some dozens of reporters. Uh, but they're but they're they're there and they're growing. And this is one of the things I think we should focus attention on. And it requires public support, public contributions, memberships, etc. Great, thanks. And we'll turn to Kelly now as uh, someone who, and I, and I see you as wearing two hats here, Kelly, as someone who is responsible for uh, educating the next generation of journalists at a time when we're facing all these challenges, while at the same time as a researcher, someone who is examining uh, the dynamics of some of what we're seeing in the in the digital space. So uh, asking if you could reflect on uh, today's topic from, from the perspective of those two roles. Of course, and the, I would like to join the others in saying how excited I am to be a part of this panel. and. Uh... And I underscore the agreement with the things that the prior panelists have said. These are really important and very challenging issues that we're dealing with. Uh, I'm going to start by commenting about where I see the school right now, this, in particular, the journalism program. You know, we're, we're a small program, but I believe that we are well positioned to respond to the changing media landscape. Journalists, are, they need a wider set of skills now than they used to. I think Akira was sort of addressing this with point about, yeah, you need to be aware of social media. We have to have a wider range of media that you're capable of using, print, audio, video. Journalists are increasingly expected to be familiar with data journalism, capitalizing on new types of data, new ways of visualizing data. Uh, it also includes the ability to, to collaborate with people uh, and people with skill sets that maybe you hadn't seen journalists collaborating before. I mean, I don't think uh, collaborating with programmers would have been a part of the toolkit not long ago, but it really is important now. Uh, and, and of course, just to circle back to it, you have to be conversant with social media. So, I mean, I think our program is, is flexible, giving our students the opportunity to explore, figure out what kind of journalists they want to be. Uh, we've been successful in recruiting students who didn't know they wanted to be journalists when they got here. And I think that's actually a pretty important part of this dynamic that we're seeing about the changing field. Uh, and I think the best advertisement for the success of our program is our students. I think mean, it's, it's a terrific example of just how uh, impressive the students who are graduating from our program are doing. But she's not alone. We have other students who have who have managed to blend interests that they came in. So, for example, um, Nella Joukowsky, she came in studying public health and neuroscience before discovering her passion for journalism. And then she went on to the Columbia Journalism School, and now she has come full circle and is working on a health-focused podcast and doing writing and producing for health-focused PBS web series. So it's, you know, it's just really exciting to see the students coming through our program and, and being able to make these connections and do things that I think the, the, the generation of Folks who are doing the educating, we can see the potential, but we aren't actually out there doing it. And it's great to see our students doing it. Great, thanks. I want to uh, invite the members of the audience to please uh, chime in with questions and um, bring those to the panelists. And um, while you're thinking of things you might want to ask, I'll, I'll ask a couple questions here myself to um, proceed. You know, the... the uh, the news that I shared uh, in my introduction about the findings that the, the Chinese have uh, are, are gearing up to uh, try to influence apparently our upcoming presidential election um, kind of is a double whammy. It, it really took me aback because we've already seen this type of disorganized disinformation campaign try to influence our um, our elections before. But what's different about this one is that they're using artificial intelligence to, uh, at least the report is that they're using artificial intelligence in order to try and pursue this. And there's been a lot written and discussed about, how, well, artificial intelligence in general, but specifically how it uh, can be used for good or ill in the journalist uh, journalism space. So I'm interested in your thoughts on <clears throat> what role you see artificial intelligence playing in the general uh, uh, at information atmosphere? Is it just a threat as we're seeing in the case of the Chinese or is there uh, 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 positive uh, applications to this new technology 
uh, in journalism. I can go first if you like. Um, I know that the Walter Cronkite School uh, is, in fact, looking into uh, ways in which AI can be used to help journalism and communications uh, and a variety of different kinds of communications. Uh, and, uh, uh, and at the same time, uh, looking for ways in which to make sure that it's not undermining uh, uh, undermining that, uh, and and not and not injecting false 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 falsities uh, in, into things. I also know that some uh, newspaper organizations, like they, these newspaper chains, are experimenting with using artificial intelligence for things like high school sports, uh, for example, which I think is a mistake. Uh, because one of the reasons why high school sports is important to local news readers uh, is to is to see their is to see things about their kids in action, and AI is not going to pick that up. AI is going to just take you know statistics and scores and make a false story out of it. So there are there are things on both sides. Never mind the injection of of other kinds of falsities uh, into the public discussion by AI, which which, which requires a lot of study. We, we're at the very beginning of I think a whirlwind involving AI. And I, I know that uh, I, I know that people like Kelly uh, and and the researchers that will be working with him are going to be looking at how, how do we how do we deal with this? Yeah, can... so, please go ahead. Yeah. Okay. And then back to you, Dr. Garrett. Um, I have a couple of unique perspectives here because I cover the administration, which is actively trying to regulate AI. It is very much not regulated <laughs> right now. Um, but also I work for a news organization that also uses AI. Um, for our internal clients, Bloomberg's internal clients, we have basically AI spits out headlines when things like earnings for major businesses. So think Disney or Coca-Cola, if they put out an earnings report, they quickly read you know, the top line numbers from that report and share it with our clients. But that is the extent to to which it operates. It's mm. showing quick numbers very quickly, but it's not doing what only journalists can do, which is what do those numbers mean? What do they mean for people's wallets? What do they mean for the company? How do they impact everyday Americans? So um, I come from that perspective as well. And I think, you know, there's definitely been problems or incidents where, you know, that AI hasn't always been successful, but for the most part, um, it's been helpful um, to our reporting. I would also say just covering politics, it, it can be very scary because you have voters who see images that are not real or propaganda or content that is not true. And I've had interviews with people who repeat things to me that are just simply not based in reality. Um, a few months ago before Donald Trump was indicted, I had family members texting me that, oh, did Trump get arrested? Because there was these AI images that were just floating on the internet. Um, and in WhatsApp chats, if anyone is familiar with that, my family is Jamaican, so they use WhatsApp a lot. Um, but there's people that are in silos and they don't have any way to fact check the information that they're getting. And it becomes truth to them. And, you know, it's not necessarily my responsibility to tell every single person that I meet um, what's true and what's false. But I do think that when you have a platform, when you have a news organization, I do think there is a role in pointing out when something that has gone viral or something that has caught on when it's not true. So it definitely presents a new element of reporting. It's what rises to the level of we need to write a story about this or we need to alert people that this is not true. But that's an excellent point because it also colors the audience's response to truth in the news media. So if you've got if members of your family are, are thinking one thing as a result of AI, they may be doubting what you are actually reporting about the administration because they've heard something entirely different that they think is true as a result of AI. Yeah, so let me just weigh in for a couple of thoughts about AI. And then I have a different set of thoughts about misinformation, which maybe we'll circle back around to. Uh, on the, the side of AI as a threat to journalists being able to craft good material. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm sure the newsrooms are paying attention to the fact that these machines are getting increasingly good at parroting English language messages. Um, and on the one hand, you can see how that could pose a threat to some journalists' role. On the other hand, good journalism really isn't about parroting about what others have already said. It's, it's about uncovering truths. Uh, and those truths can be about small things like high school football teams, or they can be about big political issues. And machines, they aren't there, and they're not going to be there for a long time. I mean, I will admit I didn't expect that they would get 
to the point that they are now as quickly as they did. So maybe we're all in for a surprise. But my sense is that right now, the tools that are out there are at best uh, tools that will allow journalists to see news digested, pre-digested, um, certain ideas sort of compiled and presented in perhaps a more readable way. So there, I think there are really important ways to use the tool. We're also exploring, can we use it as a mechanism to help students practice their own writing, get feedback on their own writing, learn to give feedback on writing. When a machine produces a writing, you can actually be quite critical of that. And so there are a lot of different and novel and potentially good opportunities to use this technology in the classroom. But at the same time, uh, it's ripe for abuse in the classroom as well. And we're, we're grappling with that. So the, um, I kind of mixed AI and social media in that question, and they're certainly interrelated, but, but they're separate. And you kind of touched on this, Kelly. Um, I want to focus more specifically on social media now for a moment and ask, Clearly, social media is the driver of the disinformation that we're seeing. And um, the the observation one of you made about how it's it's almost you didn't use this term, but it's almost like a vicious cycle where the disinformation happens. And so then there's people who believe it. And so then when they read something contrary to that in the newspaper or wherever, then it ca causes them to start question the news, not what they're seeing on social media. And then we start to see the deterioration in trust that I had highlighted earlier. And it's 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 literally a vicious cycle. So my question is, what role do you see the social media platforms themselves? Meta, what we're now calling X, I guess, uh, Instagram, uh, all of these platforms, what role do these platforms play themselves in playing some role in combating fake news? What responsibility should they bear? So since this is my research area, if I can just put a, a few pieces of uh, empirical evidence for everyone's consideration. Um, the scholars have been trying to understand the influence of social media on both the spread of misinformation and the extent to which it promotes misperceptions for quite some time. And you might be surprised to learn that the results don't match the conventional wisdom in many cases. Um, for instance, misinformation is just a tiny part of the information landscape on social media. The vast majority of information is not political or news oriented at all. That's probably not surprising. And of the stuff that is political or news oriented, relatively little of it is actively false or is a propaganda in the traditional sense. Um, further, and this is an area where I am actively working on this, social media use is not correlated with people's ability to discriminate between truths and falsehoods. There is no evidence that people who use social media are more likely to believe falsehoods, are less able to tell what's true from false. Um, and it's also at this point, the case that relatively few people who are on social media are operating in what have been called echo chambers. That is where people who they only see views that agree with them, they never see the other side. Now, these are all sort of unsettling because they, they don't line up with how we normally think about how misperceptions arrive here and how social media is related. But they also give us an opportunity to reflect about what else might be going on. I think for me, it underscores the importance of the political actors, of political elites, of high profile politicians who make false claims and double down on them when fact checked. I think we have reason to believe that it's those kinds of leaders who are shaping people's beliefs and their misperceptions more than it is the kinds of conversations that we see and the kinds of stories that go viral on social media. Uh, even to your opening point, Chris, you know, the, there were some scholars who looked at Twitter and found that falsehoods were traveling farther and faster on Twitter than truths did. Now, to be clear, they were only looking at claims that have been fact checked. And I don't know if you've noticed, but fact checkers tend to check the really interesting, juicy falsehoods, and they don't check that many truths. So in some ways, part of what they're showing is about fact checking more than it's about truth and falsehoods. Mm -hmm. but anyway, um, I will stop and let others have a word. 
So we, we have a couple uh, really good questions from the audience I want to get to in a moment, but um, something you said made me think of another question on this same line, which is I'm hearing you say that something that is quite uh, uh, contrary to conventional wisdom, which, uh, and you tell me if I have this wrong, but what I'm hearing you say, Kelly, is that the uh, role that social media plays in the spread of disinformation and the deterioration of our public discourse, if you will, uh, might be a little overstated. That that there's other fact there there certainly are other factors at play, and I, I know you're not saying it doesn't play any role, but that it's overstated. And there's other factors. You mentioned among the other factors the elites, the political elites behaving in ways that may be contributing to that. And I, I would have to submit, I don't think there's any doubt of that. Uh, but what that makes me think of is, what about so-called traditional media outlets that have morphed in the last 20 years or so, cable news uh, outlets, uh, uh, online outlets like Breitbart that serve as reliable megaphones to those political elites that are engaging in that type of behavior. Certainly that there's a role there as well for traditional media and, and not operating in the way they, that they did 40, 50 years ago. I, I think that's clearly the bigger problem. I, first of all, I'm just, I'm, I, I thank Kelly very much for that information because that, uh, that's fresh information that I think is very important that he's, he's uncovered. Uh, but yes, I think that's a really big, big problem. The echo chamber created by Fox News and Breitbart and, and all those, all those things, uh, for, for misinformation. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, and they, that makes, that makes people wonder then why when they hear something entirely opposite. Uh, from the from from fact-based news media, uh, they, they they don't believe it because they're they have been hearing this other thing all time long. I mean, I have relatives, as I guess other people do, who have Fox News on all day long, and so that's their world. Uh, and uh, and and they 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 question me about things that they're published in the Washington Post or New York Times uh, that is contrary, even though it's true that it's contrary to what they've been hearing all the time in this little world that they exist in. I want to echo as well. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah Dr. Geard's findings were uh, definitely insightful. Um, but I think all this sort of underscores the fact that I do think journalists need to be on social media <laughs> and they should be on um, as many platforms as they can. The only reason that I made a Twitter is because Spencer Hunt's class required me to, <laughs> uh, <laughs> to give attendance every day. And yeah, yeah. <laughs> At the time, I was like, "This is very ridiculous. I don't want to be on Twitter." But um, I'm very grateful that I that I have it now, or sh I guess it's called X now. I'm sorry. Um, yeah, right. But I think more than you know, more than whether or not I want to be on those platforms, it's that's where people are, and, and frankly, that's where people get their information. So I think journalists have to be in places where readers are, where their audience is. And that's the only way we're going to remain relevant if we continue to to meet people where they are. And sometimes that's on TikTok and sometimes that, that's that's on YouTube or Facebook. Um, and I think news organizations realize they have to be on those platforms. But I think also journalists themselves um, have to figure out what's the best platforms and how many they can feasibly manage to, to reach those people. And also, you can also use social media as a reporting tool. David Farenthold who won a Pulitzer Prize at the Washington Post for his investigative reporting now at the New York Times, unfortunately, uh, <laughs> and speaks to my class every year, which is fortunate, actually, about how he goes about doing his reporting. But he actually goes on to things like Twitter and talks about what it is he's been finding and, and asks the questions uh, about uh, uh, they, they can't get answers to yet to see if the audience is going to come up with answers. A famous one was when he was investigating the Trump Foundation and realized that the Trump Foundation had paid for a painting of Trump uh, that was not, uh, which is oh. kind of a, not a normal thing for a charitable foundation to do. And he wondered, mm -hmm. where is this painting? And so he asked that on Twitter he, and, uh, and he got an answer. Somebody who worked in one of uh, Trump's golf courses saw the painting uh, on in the uh, above the bar of that golf course. Took a picture of it, sent it to David, and that solved the solved the puzzle. So you you can also uh, journalists can use social media as a reporting tool. The one question involved is whether or not 
you're give, giving your personal opinions on social media that would raise credibility about your reporting and, and the credibility of the news organization for which you're working. I assume Bloomberg has some rules about that, just as the Washington Post and the New York Times have rules about that. We do. Yes, we do. Yeah. So, and, I mean, so no, go I'm ahead. just going to follow up on this notion of social media as source. I think that's a it's, it's a great example of the wisdom of crowds, right? If you can diffuse a problem to a huge crowd, you can find some really interesting things. But also tying back into misinformation and AI, we know that foreign actors will sometimes use social media accounts to promote I stories that advantage them. And we've seen, unfortunately, cases where journalists are being taken in and we're seeing foreign actors are not, Un, it's not unlikely that they're the social media accounts getting quoted because they're the ones who say the really quotable stuff. So it is a really complicated balance. It's important to be there. It's important to be using the source, but it's also uh, tricky to make sure you're using it just the way you want. Right. That's a good segue, I think, to, to two of our uh, audience questions, um, because w what I'm drawing from uh, this conversation is that in order to achieve this uh, future that we envision, um, we need to have, have journalists who are uh, well-trained and um, well-versed on all the latest tools and challenges, et cetera, the dangers of AI, the potential applications, et cetera. Um, and we need to have a, 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 a um, news-consuming public that is um, uh, educated and uh, oriented around understanding how to consume news in this more complicated environment in a way that's going to help them understand the truth. So um, one question we received from the audience is, what is the nationwide trend in regard to young people joining the journalism field? Uh, what factors are affecting that? And then specifically for you, Akela, um, and maybe we'll start with this one and get to the other two, because I think Kelly and, and Len can comment on the other two. So let's start with this last one. The the member of the audience wants to know from you, Akela, why did you decide to become a journalist? OK, I can start with that question. Well, um, I was like Dr. Garrett mentioned, I did not start at Ohio State um, as a journalism major. I was undecided or the fancy term for it at Ohio State is the School of Exploration. Um, mm -hmm. So I was in the School of Exploration for um, about half a semester. Um, but I had to high school journalism. I was editor in chief of my high school paper. Um, so I had experience in journalism. Um, but frankly, I came back to it because I, I was interested in so many different things. And I loved that journalism allowed me to learn about pretty much anything I was interested in by just talking to people that are experts and very smart about it. And it allowed me to change interests. I could cover politics one day. I could cover immigration. I could cover mental health. And that's sort of how I came back to it. It just felt like a very natural segue into this girl has no idea what she wants to do or what her favorite topic is. And this place allows her to learn about everything um, and teach other people about it, inform other people about it. Um, so that's how, sort of how I came back to it, just out of a sense of curiosity and um, not really not <laughs> knowing what major I was going to choose. Great. So um, with with uh, Kayla's reflections there, I'll turn to Len and, and Kelly. Um, what is the nationwide trend in regard to uh, other young people uh, choosing this same path that Akela did in the journalism field? And uh, what are some of the factors that you see affecting uh, those decisions? Well, I'll, I'll go first because Kelly's going to be smarter about this than I am. Uh, uh, we are finding at Arizona State, at the Cronkite School, that in fact, the uh, interest in journalism is as high as ever. And the, the, uh, and, the, and the interesting thing is that there are certain drivers for this. One is sports journalism is a really huge growth area. Uh, in journalism, you can imagine why, with all the sports around us everywhere and all the media involved in it, uh, and you know, leagues are setting up their own uh, news organizations, for example. So it's not just the Washington Post covering uh, colleges. The, the, uh, the Big Ten has its own uh, its own journalism program and its own news program 
for example. So there's a lot of opportunity in that. There's also new opportunity in business journalism that didn't exist in the past. Uh, in, my, in my era, which is a long time ago, there was very little good business journalism, among other things, because we as journalists didn't understand anything about business. And that nowadays it's being taught much more, much better than it was before. And so there's a growth area there too. Also, there's a growth, there are growth areas in the different ways of producing journalism, the different skills involved, podcasts, video casts, uh, 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 combination reporting, uh, uh, journalists who, who take who take pictures and do reporting and do writing all at the same time. There, there are all these new platforms for for for, uh, for, for journalism, uh, and as a result, it, it's exciting to be learning not just about journalism, but to learning the skills involved in conveying this journalism to the public. And that's what I find a lot of excitement in students about. And then lastly, what I teach, of course, is investigative reporting still, uh, currently to master's students in our Howard Center for Investigative Reporting. And they are motivated by making a difference, not by making a difference by being advocates, but by uncovering things, presenting that to the public and letting the public change uh, what's going on. Uh, and and a lot, some of them are career changers. I'm talking about school teachers and Peace Corps volunteers, uh, lawyers. My my favorite was a uh, 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 an, uh, an investigator, a fraud investigator who wanted to be an investigative journalist. I right now in my class have a man in his 50s who's become who's been very successful in business, completely retired, can do nothing if, at all for the rest of his life if he wants to, and he's decided that he wants to be an investigative journalist, even if it only means that he can write books or 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 volunteer things to news organizations. Uh, and uh, and he's, he's a very good member of my class, and I expect that he's going to wind up working in this field. So as fast as I could think of things to add to this list, then would tick them off. So <laughs> rather than try and build on this list, what I will say is that after this session, I will share a video that the students who are involved in The Lantern put together last year, explaining in their own words why they love The Lantern why they're involved in it, because you can't beat that for a way of understanding where they're coming from. Right, great. That's great, thank you. So Lynn, you mentioned, uh, you used the term advocacy journalism yes. uh, a moment ago, and that reminded me of a, a piece that you did recently uh, about objectivity. Um, and you know, those of us who, who went to journalism school and were practicing journalists, that was kind of a watchword, at least for myself coming up in the nineties as a journalist, sure. we're, you have to be objective. And, um, why don't you tell us about the piece that, that you've done and, and, uh, your critique of this concept of objectivity. Right. But it, it's actually work that was done by myself and, uh, uh, and, uh, Andrew Hayward, the former president of CBS news is also in the mm -hmm. Cronkite faculty. Uh, and with a with a, a grant, we spent the last we spent the, all of 2022 uh, doing research all across the country and what is going on in newsrooms, newsrooms that are growing more diverse, trying to cover a more diverse society. And what we discovered was that increasing numbers of leaders of newsrooms, besides young journalists, uh, were feeling that objectivity was in fact a white construct. But going back to the days when I you know when I entered journalism, newsrooms were all white and all male. Uh, and the leadership was all white and all male. And from that era came this idea that objectivity uh, w w was a kind of balance in journalism, both sides of any issue, et cetera. Uh, and, and, and that the, in, uh, the subjects being covered were subjects that were by and large only known to white males and not everything else was going on in society. And society has changed so much since then. We've become a much more diverse country and newsrooms are finally becoming more diverse. So many of them are now half female, uh, and, and a larger percentage of minority journalists, uh, and and they don't believe they 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 see a bigger world to cover uh, than the world of white male objectivity, uh, and they see that uh, that uh, uh, presenting facts does not always add up to balancing things out. My favorite example of this is climate change. Uh, back when we were first covering climate change, when I was running the Washington Post, uh, stories by and large were balanced. You'd have scientists saying there's this thing out there happening in the climate caused by mankind that is a, a, a threat to the future. And then you and then you balance that out with the people that say, oh, no, that's not true. Uh, and, you know, the gas, you know, the gas and the oil industry, you know, we really need fossil fuels, et cetera. Uh, and that that's not the case anymore. We know that's not the case anymore. You still need to give representation to views that are contrary uh, to to the primary facts you're presenting. But but the, but but the facts should, should carry the day. 
uh, and uh, it's, it's, so it's, it's and 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 communities that hadn't been covered well very, very at all before need to be covered now. African American communities, uh, immigrant communities, and so on uh, issues that were never covered before need to be covered now, uh, and that is changing in American newsrooms. The reaction to what we did dwelled on this idea of we we called our 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 our, uh, our report beyond objectivity. You can find it on the internet. Uh, and I and I wrote a piece of, about what was that about for the Washington Post, uh, and the reaction to it was uh, really not paying attention to most of what was in my piece, but just that we're rejecting objectivity as a standard, uh, jour journalistic objectivity as opposed to what you may think of objective in terms of thinking or something else in life, um, uh, was that we were we were in endorsing advocacy journalism, left wing journalism, liberal journalism. Uh, and so conservatives uh, attacked my piece and banned me about that. And I even wound up uh, uh, conducting a debate about it with uh, Brett Stevens, the conservative columnist of the New York Times, which you can find on open to, open to debate dot com, uh, in which actually he and I agreed about all the things about you know fact based journalism, except for this question of objectivity. Uh, and so I, I think it's I think part of our critique was misunderstood. But the things that we've advocated, we've been uh, teaching in uh, not teaching, but discussing uh, in, uh, in in newsrooms around the country. Uh, and and that and that's been going well because it, newsrooms want to change. If I could if I could just add to that point, please. I do think it's um, it's so important for student journalists, but all journalists to have education, to have the tools to understand various different communities. And there's also importance for there to be guidance, whether if there's the AP style book or whether there's your newsroom's <laughs> internal style, there should be guidance on how to describe and how to talk about different communities. Um, one thing that I've always pushed for in my stories, and I believe AP Saw has also pushed for this, is to no longer use the term African-American, but Black American, unless you know for certain where that person is from. If they do not Good know point. where they're you know, originated from, Black American is is the, the preferred or the, or the better term to use there. But I think this is true for all journalists. You know, Being a Black person does not make me an expert on the Black community. Everybody needs education about any kind of communities that they're covering. And we all cover various different types of communities, whether, you know, we cover the government or we cover education. Everything we do, do touches all these different communities. And I think there should be a, com a component in newsrooms and student journalism programs to educate people on how to cover them properly. Totally agree. And and you're uh, reminding me I should be using Black American rather than African American is exactly why newsrooms need to be not just diverse, but the leaders of the newsrooms need to hear the members of the staff on issues like that and learn from it, be educated by it, and then come to good decisions about how to cover the news. We have one attendee who wrote, when did objectivity become so important to the to journalists in the 1970s? What about the muckrakers? They for sure wouldn't be thought of as being objective, nor the magazines of the 30s and 40s, like Time, The Atlantic, The Nation. Seems to be a false flag for not ruffling too many feathers and helping those who are in power. That's, That's a good observation. And in fact, I was an investigative reporter in the 1960s when that was still relatively rare. Uh, and and uh, and I wrote a book called The New Muckrakers about all of us who were doing that work at that time. Uh, and uh, uh, that that's clearly not objective, but it's also not advocacy. It's not opinion. It's uncovering things that need to be uncovered uh, and, and 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 making them clear to the public. Here's another one that's a right to the point uh, from Ron Schaefer in the audience. And he's directing this uh, to you, Len, but I think others will have thoughts on this. Uh, put simply, can local newspapers be saved? My local Williamsburg, Virginia Gazette is oldest paper in the U.S., but struggling under hedge fund ownership. This, and, right. and, and Ron notes that he was uh, the editor in chief of The Lantern in 1962. Yes, Thank he was. That, and and uh, I may have been the managing editor under him. I, I had some sort of senior editor position under Ron at that time. And we remain friends up until now. And I always hear from him when I speak in public, which I'm glad. That's great. Really glad to hear. Uh, so that's a very good question. Uh, and there are many papers like that around the country. And the ones that are being saved have been have either been given have been bought out from uh, these these hedge fund hedge fund owners. 
Uh, there are a number. There, there are and be, some of them have become nonprofits. Uh, others have been bought by by family owners who want to save them. Uh, and they 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 bought papers from Gannett, which is a terrible owner right now of too many newspapers around the country. Uh, and that, that that is one of the best ways to save those newspapers. Uh, and and it's important, I think, for the citizens of those areas where the newspapers are not good, to 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 raise to raise it raise that question, raise that issue. Well, what can be done? How can we get this paper away from the hedge fund? How can we get somebody locally or or a uh, or a nonprofit to to buy it and to and to run it? But that is happening around the country. Um, I'd like to ask this of of a, a, a Kayla. I'm reflecting on your. Uh, I, I loved you sharing about how Spencer. Uh, and for those of you who don't know it, probably everyone knows this, but I'll say Spencer Hunt is the uh, one of the most capable, outstanding advisors of the Lantern we've ever had uh, and is the current advisor and was uh, Kayla's advisor. And he he does have this practice of taking attendance on Twitter. And I love just looking at my Twitter feed and seeing the kids checking in on, on Spencer's class. But what made what that made me think of, Kayla, is, you know, that so you, you're still using Twitter and we talked about social media um, I, I'm certain you've had the experience of um, posting things and then it's human nature to uh, monitor that engagement, right? How many clicks did I get? How many likes did I get? Uh, it's it's the currency of, uh, of social media. And it certainly has bled into journalism. I remember when I was the editor of The Lantern in the in the early 90s, we we it was the first time that the news was put online in a very rudimentary way on the internet. We didn't even call it the web then. And I and and for the very first time we got a printout one day, I remember this distinctly, of the clicks that these stories got. You know, the last week's worth of headlines and how many people actually clicked on them. And it was like, wow, we can we don't have to guess what our audiences are interested in anymore. We can see it, you know. So what that's driven, I believe, is this click bait mentality, not just on social media, but in, in journalism. And so we have a question from a, an audience member that was submitted before the, the discussion that asks, how can news organizations strike a balance between producing content that attracts readership, clicks, hence revenue, but also maintaining journalistic integrity and 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 contributing to uh, to the democratic discourse, if you will. So I, I'm asking you, Akela, as someone who's who's who has to go out there every day today, right now, and do this. Yeah, I mean, I think even me, I always check like how many views did my tweet get, how many likes did it get, and it's it, there is a sense of gratification when something goes a little bit viral or gets more than a thousand mm -hmm. likes. Like, you want that. You want that. You want people to read your work. But I think one thing that I have found is true is good journalism is always going to do well. Exclusive content, scoops, investigations, no matter what, if you're the only news organization that has it, people are going to go to your organization. Now that requires managers and editors who value that content and who are going to give you time to to pursue those kinds of projects, which I'm lucky to have at Bloomberg. But I think not every newsroom has that. And there is sort of the push that you mentioned to really go after what's trending, to write the headline that's going to get clicks, um, to pull people in, to sometimes misleading headlines, headlines that are not true once you read the actual story. Um, mm -hmm. I think that's certainly a, pro a, a problem. But I also think, again, Good journalism is always going to drive people to your site. If you have it first, or if you're the only one that has it, that is going to trump anything else that's dominating the news cycle. Even me, I, I write the same stories that other White House reporters write that, you know, Biden said this today. But once you can break out from that day to day grind and write a bigger story, a bigger piece, those are the things that's going to set you apart as a reporter. And they're also going to get you more views, more audience. Let's create a very complex set of incentives and, and some problems with those incentives because, as Akela says, novelty attracts attention. And it turns out it's easier to be novel when you're just making stuff up. So a lot of the, uh, the fact that we see in some domains misinformation generating a lot of attention for a particular outlet 
If you add up all the traffic that true stories get, they tend to be getting more attention than false stories. But if you take any one false story, well, it's not very many places. And so the one place where it appears or the couple places where it appears get a lot of attention. It creates these incentives for um, people who are primarily focused on trying to generate revenue through eyeballs to create headlines that are at best clickbaity and at worst just outright falsehoods. And I don't have a good answer for that. I mean, because, because I have right in front of me, like we, the Lantern last month had 750,000 views of its social media uh, video accounts. Great. Wow. This, we pay attention to this. Like, obviously, I, I know this number. I know how many people have seen the site because we are paying attention to these things at the same time that I know that paying attention to this can have harmful consequences. Len, is there a role for the journalism professor uh, uh, in, in teaching journalists how to achieve this balance going into the field? Well, um, I, 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 I think uh, Kayla said it right. Her, clearly her journalism professors taught her well. Uh, you you want to do good work and you want to do work that is going to be, uh, uh, whenever possible, uniquely good. Uh, insight that somebody else doesn't have, information that somebody else doesn't have, uh, an investigation that somebody else doesn't do. Uh, and uh, and uh, uh, that's the way to, to, uh, to, to go after audience. Which brings us full circle to the concerns about AI and journalists, right? AI is not yes. going to do those things. Yes, correct. Yep. Yeah. Um, I want to, before I forget, take the opportunity to share, since I, I'm, I know many of you are joining us today, are graduates uh, or affiliates of the School of Communication and the Lantern, that there will be a Lantern reunion on October 20th at the Blackwell Inn in Columbus. We have a very special guest named Bruce Valanche, who some of you may know, he was uh, around that same era uh, as you, Len, uh, maybe a little bit later. Um, Alex Every, is sharing- Everybody a... was later than me, everybody. No, <laughs> <laughs> uh, we had that one couple at the, at the Lantern reunion last year that was from the 50s and they had met at the lantern it was it was wonderful right. um and to our to the best of our knowledge this last year was the first time if you can believe it uh, that the lantern had 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 an organized reunion um certainly the first time in in recent memory well the second one is going to be this uh, october 20th it's a home football game weekend alex has put the uh link into the chat and so we would encourage anyone and everyone to uh register and attend that event um and uh, if you're inclined, please share it with your friends uh, and colleagues who uh, also might be interested in, in attending the, uh, the reunion. Okay, School, I just want to- want... The Lantern are all very excited for folks to come back and see what we're doing. We, we are uh, in the midst of planning a renovation of the Lantern space, actually moving to a new larger space, which will allow us to do some really interesting things, which we hope to be able to share during this event. So. I hope that many of you are able to make it. Thanks, Kelly. Yeah, that's that's an important note uh, on that. Um, there there are various versions of this next question that have come in, and I want to I want to try and frame this up. You know, we've talked about the problems, uh, the challenges in the current environment, and we've correctly focused almost exclusively on uh, the supply side of the equation, if you will, right? So um, I want to turn for a moment to the demand side of the equation, and we've nibbled around the edges of this, but uh, the term that often gets used and is used in this question that was submitted by um, folks before the, uh, the event is media literacy. Um, and an increasingly complex environment with fake news and, and uh, misinformation and disinformation and bots uh, and all the rest of it, um, clearly the need, for whatever you want to call it, I'll use the term media literacy, but clearly the need to have a public who is educated and capable of making sound decisions about consuming news is uh, as important uh, as it's ever been. So what are your thoughts on how that can be achieved? 
there, there, there is a media literacy movement, uh, uh, and it uh, rose in two different places. One, one place was it was a suburban Washington, where a former journalist began a media literacy literacy movement that has now spread to many parts of the country. Uh, it teaches media literacy in uh, in uh, in schools uh, and in colleges, uh, and then in, uh, I think I forget the name of the university in uh, New York. Uh, that started it on university campuses as well. Uh, it, it's, it's reaching thousands of students uh, and growing all the time. And I think it's extremely important and something that uh, is, uh, is worthy of support. I would add that the, the empirical evidence demonstrates that it really works. People who have experienced media literacy uh, interventions of a variety of sorts, anything from a semester-long class or a curriculum wide sort of effort to um, 10 minute gamification of learning about how social media can be used to amplify misinformation, whatever mechanism you use to promote media literacy, we tend to see positive outcomes. We see people getting better at detecting uh, bad actors, getting uh, detecting misleading headlines and, and ending up with a more accurate set of Police. Now, to be clear, there's no silver bullet. Like this is not going to solve the misinformation mm -hmm. problem. We're not going to have everyone agree about what the truth is, but it is a critical, critically important part of this problem. Yeah, and, and just to add to that, I do think it's important for teachers and not just college professors. I mean, like elementary, middle, high school to emphasize the importance of responsible news consumption. I do think that if we're going to combat the decline in trust in our institutions, in, in newspapers and journalism in general, that it has to start early. It has to come from a government that also supports freedom of the press. I think there has to be sort of just this education and this awareness that this is still important, because I do think there is appetite to consume media, but it's just not always the news. <laughs> um, and I do think there there needs to be some feeding of vegetables, if you will. Um, to students as they're coming up. Yeah, I, I would add that st uh, that student journalism, which Kayla and I are both graduates of, uh, in different eras, is really important. I I, I was uh, I, I had an English teacher in elementary school who started a student newspaper when I was in the fifth grade. I was a reporter on it then. In the sixth grade, I was its editor, and I was sold for the rest of my life. And so, junior high, senior high, and and Ohio State, all along the way, I was I was a student journalist. Uh, and uh, that that's that's also uh, and not everybody who's a student journalist becomes a professional journalist, but they will have learned about journalism and its values as a result of being student journalists. Great point. And Kelly, it's encouraging to hear you uh, indicate that the research is telling us that these programs work. Uh, that's that's good news. So we need we need more of that. It sounds like we're all in agreement. Um, on that. We only have two minutes left. Um, and uh, I, I'll ask if any of the panelists have something um, on their mind that we were that, that we didn't get to in the course of the various questions we've asked in general. Because if not, I, I have one, which is uh, to and this is probably more for Kelly, but um, we've used these terms I certainly have, and they've come up in the course of the conversation, misinformation, disinformation, fake news. The term fake news has been polluted by uh, one of those political elites we were referring to earlier. Let's set that one aside. Misinformation and disinformation. Um, my understanding is that, you know, misinformation is the broader category of just stuff that's out there that's not true. And then within that category, disinformation is the stuff that is misinformation and is intentionally promulgated by, by a bad actor. Yes, that, that's how I would summarize it. And I would point out that there are a variety of common sources of misinformation that have nothing to do with bad intentions. Um, satire is sadly frequently mistaken for yeah. real news. The and Onion, yeah. Startlingly frequent. The, we've actually done some experimental work where we are presenting people just, just to get a baseline to see how people do. And and it's, I mean, we'll, we'll have 40% of people saying, well, that's definitely true. Uh, <laughs> wow. No, it's the onion or it's the Babylon Bee. 
Um, so there's that kind of stuff. There's um, th there are clickbait headlines which can be misleading. There could be memory errors. Like we aren't all walking encyclopedias. We hear something, we make a note of it, and then we tell the story over again. And like a game of operator, it changes. So it's mm -hmm. it's really important to remember that misinformation has a variety of sources. Misperceptions are very complicated, having to do with identity and information exposure and a, a bunch of other stuff. That's interesting. So we're at time, but I want to ask uh, the 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 kicker sort of question I had to that. And I don't know if research, uh, and I think Kelly, you'd be the one to answer this. And I don't know if research has shed light on this, but do we have a handle on what percentage of misinformation is disinformation? Uh, I would, I'm not able to give you a number off the top of my head, but it's a very small percent. Um, disinformation is just like misinformation is a small part of the larger information ecosystem, at least in social media, uh, mm -hmm. disinformation is an even smaller slice. The problem, however, is that there are, uh, especially in new news deserts where there are no good local news sources, uh, disinformation sources can become the only source around uh, these sites that set themselves up with uh, sort of pink slime media or a variety of yeah. other kinds of media that exploit the, the gaps in our existing news infrastructure. And that's that means that while globally the problems of mis and disinformation may be relatively modest, locally in particular hotspots, it can really be a big problem. That's an inter very interesting observation. And we'll have to end on that. I wish we had another hour, but we don't. We've we've uh, used up more than our allotment of time. So I will thank our panelists, Akela Gardner, Lennon Downey Jr., Kelly Garrett, uh, thanks so much for uh, for joining for the conversation. I, I found it interesting, and I hope everyone else did as well. And to our participants who joined us today, uh, thanks very much, and um, we'll be in touch. Appreciate uh, everybody's time today. Thanks very thanks much. Everyone. Bye. Guys, Take care. bye.